So good to see each one of you here today to be with your family and to worship our God together. It is a pleasure uh, to be able to assemble with people that love God, love one another, and to feel as though we're bringing honor and glory to God. We just we are delighted to have you. I know you're here with your family. We're glad to have you. Hope that you'll come back any time that you can. For our congregation tonight, uh, we have some question and answers that we will be dealing with tonight. So if uh, we invite you to come back with us at 6 o'clock, and we'll be dealing uh, with those. You have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to look at some things pertaining to 1 Corinthians 15. Um, I do want to say that I know that Easter Sunday is an annual holiday celebrated by the world and celebrated by millions of people uh, as the Resurrection Day. Of course, the Christians in the first century didn't just take one day a year and to celebrate that day. Uh, I know Acts four verse uh, Acts twelve verse four says that it uses the word Easter there in the King James, but in the original Greek it is the word Passover, translated Passover in every other passage except Acts twelve and verse number four. But you know the resurrection is very appropriate subject to be able to preach any time. And so I want to talk to you about the significance of Christ's resurrection. I want to just go to 1 Corinthians 15 and give some arguments on why the resurrection actually happened. If you know anything about uh, critics and what they say about the resurrection, they laugh and they scoff. I guess you're aware of the fact uh, that uh, folks belittle uh, the resurrection. Some believe in the swoon theory that Jesus didn't really die, he just passed out and uh, that they hid the body uh, from the enemies. Uh, others believe that, no, that uh, perhaps the, uh, the enemy came and stole the body. Uh, there's all kinds of theories, all kinds of positions, but those of us that believe the Bible, we believe exactly what God said about it. And it's very important. Friends, the very basics of our faith is, did the resurrection ha- happen? And how did it happen? Why did it happen? And it's interesting because our own resurrection is predicated upon whether Jesus is the first fruits of the dead or not. If Jesus didn't come forth from the dead, then neither would you. The little boy was in a truck with his daddy on one occasion, and there was a bumblebee that came in. His, his little boy was a very, very allergic to, uh, highly allergic to uh, bumblebees, and he started screaming. And his daddy just reached over and grabbed that bee and just threw it out the window. And lo and behold, that, that thing came back again. And his, the little boy just went berserk and afraid that that bee was going to sting him and that he would die. And so the father reaches in his hand and he grabs that bee and he squeezes the bee. And, but the bee goes down the floorboard and it starts doing that again. The little boy got real upset and he said, look, son. I've got the stinger. I took the stinger for you. You know, that's what Jesus did for us. 1 Corinthians 15. The Bible says in verse number 55 and verse 56, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Just like daddy took that sting, like any daddy would, take that sting for his boy. My friends, Jesus took the sting of death and sin for us that we might be the first fruits of the dead. He, that we might follow in His footsteps. I want to look at several things about Christ. Notice in 1 Corinthians 15, this is what we're going to do. We're going to expose the text, an expository sermon. So just open up the text. This will be primarily where we're located today. Now, if Christ was not raised. Look at what he says in verse 14. If Christ be not risen. Here's the argument. There were some in the church at Corinth that had gotten to the point that they believed that it was impossible for Jesus to have risen from the dead. And they said uh, that if He arose from the dead, 
uh, then why are we still here? And they had all kinds of arguments. But look at verse 14. If Christ was not raised, verse 14, then our preaching is vain. It goes to go uh, goes to show that hey, if the resurrection didn't happen, if Christ did not uh, was not raised from the dead, our preaching is vain, and it the idea is that it's empty, that it's meaningless, and what why should we be preaching the resurrection? Why should we be preaching that He raised? And if we do preach that, and it's not true, then our preaching is in vain. And by the way, the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ that He came to seek and to save the lost that He came to save multitudes of sin. But guess what? If Christ did what raise, the good news becomes the bad news. Or there is no good news. There is no good news because our Lord and Savior is still in the grave. I read this the other day. I thought it was interesting. Abraham Lincoln's casket was opened in 1901 because it was feared that his body was not there. Christ's tomb was open to prove that He is not there. Isn't that something? 1901, they opened up Abraham because they wanted to make sure He was there. The tomb was pulled back, or the rock from the tomb, to show that He wasn't there. Think about this for a moment. If Jesus, verse 14, if He be not risen, then our preaching is vain. And notice number two, He says, our faith is in vain. That word faith there it comes from the Greek word kenos. And kenos means empty, fruitless, void of effect. Faith in the gospel would be in vain. Why? Because a dead Savior cannot give life. He said that you destroy this body in three days. I'll build it back. I'll raise it up. Are you going to do it or not? Titus 1-2 says God can't lie. And if he was not raised from the dead, then he lied. And if he lied and he wasn't raised from the dead, then my friends, you don't have any hope whatsoever. Your faith is in vain. Your preaching is in vain. What are we going to do? Where are we going to go? What, what other plan does God have? The plan of God involved that His Son and our Savior die on the cross. They would put Him in the tomb. And on the third day, He would come forth. And He did come forth. They even put guards out there. Somebody said, well, how in the world was He raised from the dead? They they sealed the tomb. They protected the tomb. It's empty. Somebody says, "It's, it's, it's impossible. Not with God. No, my friends. Not with God. We believe God. We believe the Bible. And the Bible says that He came forth on that early Sunday morning, the Lord's Day. Number three, I want you to notice, if you will, not only is our faith in vain, but look in verse number uh, 15. The apostles would have been false witnesses. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God and raised Him up, Christ, whom He raised not up, if so, if so be that the dead rise not. That Jesus, look in Acts 2.32. He says that Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are His witnesses. They swore these uh, early uh, apostles as they were preaching on the day of Pentecost. It says in Acts 2 and verse number 30, Therefore being a prophet, knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him, that the fruit of his loins, according to his flesh, would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. My friends, if Jesus did not arise from the grave, he is not on his throne now. And number two, look at verse 31, seeing that therefore he spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, neither did his flesh seek corruption. Therefore God hath raised him up, and we are all his witnesses. Did you see that? We are witnesses. In Acts 10, in verse 39 through 41, if you look at that passage, when Peter is preaching uh, to Cornelius, it's, he makes an interesting statement that I really never thought about until I prepared for this lesson. I want you to look at what he says in verse 39 through 41, Acts 10, and we are witnesses. Did you know what it took in the Old Testament to establish a fact or truth? It took two or three witnesses. You look in verse number 39, and we are his witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and Jerusalem, 
and whom they slew and hang on a tree, and how God raised him up on the third day, showed him openly, not just to all the people, but unto the witnesses chosen before God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he arose from the dead. You know, my friends, if Jesus was not arisen from the grave, did you know that his witnesses were liars? They were false witnesses. You can't believe anything they said. If they were wrong about this, they could have been wrong about anything. So therefore, you take the Bible, you throw it in a trash can and forget it because the Bible is a lie. But we know, according to Acts 10, 39 through 41, Acts 2, and this passage, that we are not. They are not false witnesses. He was seen about, about 500. Was he seen? It says, it says he was. Yeah, they saw him. You mean people ate and drank with him? Text says he did. They did. Somebody said, how did, how did that happen? My friends, he was the Son of God. He had all power. He had the power to come forth from the grave. We sing that song, Up from the grave he arose. Hallelujah. Christ arose. Now those of us that are New Testament Christians, we, we don't just do this once a year. Every Lord's Day we get together. When we come to worship God, we understand the power of the resurrection and we understand that we observe the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the gospel of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. And we believe it and we believe it because the Bible says it and because there are witnesses. Witnesses. You can go to the grave of Buddha. Go to the grave of Confucius. You can go to the grave of any man and you can see they still occupy the tomb. But my friends, you go to the tomb of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and He arose from the grave. And that's what these witnesses are testifying about. These witnesses said, not only did we witness Him to be being killed, but we witnessed Him being buried and we witnessed Him coming forth from the grave and we testify that it's true. We know it's true. Not only that, I want you to notice, if Christ was not raised, look at verse number 17, and if Christ be not raised, then your faith is vain, and yet are you still in your sins. Well, the, the apostles point to the obvious conclusion. If Christ is still in the grave, and He didn't come forth from the grave, then we're still in our sins. Because our sins, and the forgiveness of our sins is predicated Upon the death of Jesus, the Bible says, and when He died, the Bible says that He was buried. He came forth to reign on the right hand of God, and He's ruling and He's reigning on His throne. In 1 Corinthians 15, 24, He's going to bring forth an end. He's going to take the kingdom. He's going to deliver it to His Father. And all that's predicated because we are no longer in our sins. If we're still in our sins, what makes us any different than the world? What makes us different, any different than the agnostic, the, the moderns, the skeptic, the atheist, anyone else? You see, friends, the difference between a Christian and the world is that a Christian has applied the grace of God to their lives, have obeyed the gospel, they have believed in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord, they have obeyed the gospel, they're living for the Lord. That's the significance of Christ's resurrection. And when you look at this passage in verse 17, he says, if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. I want you to notice the idea of your faith in vain. Friends, have you ever believed in something for a long time and you really, really believed it was true and then you were disappointed because you found out it really wasn't true? All of us have probably done that. Maybe something in our families that we were told, and well, it really not that way. And we were disappointed and we were surprised. You know, friends, when time has been, if it spans for another million years, the fact of the matter is, because Jesus arose from the grave, we are out of our sins if we obey the gospel. That's the hope we have. That's different than the world. Our faith is not in vain, and we're not in our sins. Why? Because Jesus arose from the grave. That tomb was empty, just like it was prophesied. And the Lord said, you destroy this body and I will raise it up on the third day. And He did. I want you to notice, if Christ was not raised, then 
believers would perish at His death. Look at verse 18. Then they also, which are fallen asleep in Christ, are perished. Not any better off. Verse 18, there's an old atonement for sin. Our destiny would depend upon whether our Lord came forth from the grave. Our destiny depends upon our own, our own resurrection. And if our Lord doesn't resurrect from the grave, and then you're not going to resurrect from the grave, and if you don't resurrect from the grave, and the Lord doesn't resurrect from the grave, uh, then you're just like the world, and there is no hope. You are down. You are destroyed. And you will perish. I don't know anything else that's any more sad than that. No atonement for sin. You understand that? Someone said the word atonement means at one meant. At one meant. That means that the state of being at one with God. That's what atonement. He is our atonement. That means that we are at the state of being one with Christ. Justification. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Man, can you understand that believers have perished at death? Did you know that if Jesus is still in the tomb, if He didn't come forth from the grave, if somebody stole the, tomb, uh, the body, and He didn't really resurrect like He said He did, did you know, my friends, that when you die, that you're dead all over, and that's the end of you, period? Wouldn't that be a sad, sad state of affairs? That our God created everything in the, on the earth. Psalm 24 verse 1, the earth belongs to the Lord. Everything therein. God created man. He gave us a soul that will never die. And yet God unfair. God, that's so unloving and uncharacteristic of a Jehovah God who cares and loves us, but yet He didn't give us a means whereby our souls could be saved. Friends, that's what that means in verse 18. Believers will perish at death because there's no other means. There's no other hope to be forgiven. Not only that, Christians are to be pitied. Look at verse 19. Oh, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiful, most miserable. Did you know, because if in this life only we have hope in, if the only thing we're living for now is the here and the now, and we don't have an eternity to live for, we're miserable. We're pitiful. You understand that? We're pitiful. There is no hope. There is no peace. There's no tranquility of the soul. Are you, are you aware of the fact that this verse says, if in this life only we have, we've got something else to look forward to. We've got an eternity to live for. Not only that, the good news, He is arisen. What? Yeah, He has arisen. It verifies our justification. I want you to notice but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on Him that Jesus Christ, our Lord, was raised from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses, and was raised up again for our justification. Let me show you what the word justification means. It is a judicial term. And literally, it means in a judicial act where that God treats us as those that were in uh, in separation from God, those that would sin against God, those that were in violation of God, be because of Jesus Christ and because of our obedience to the gospel, we've been justified. That is that God has made a judicial act to pronounce us clean, to pronounce us pure. That's what the resurrection does. That's what the resurrection does. It justifies us. It makes us pure. It pronounces us clean. Number two, not only that, it gives us hope concerning our own resurrection. In 1 Peter 1, in verse number 3, as His divine, uh, abundant mercy hath begotten us unto a living hope, or a lively hope, by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. What do we, have? we have a living hope. Friends, I know I'm going to come forth from the grave. Oh, you can go to the cemeteries, or you can be, uh, you can go wherever. And you just think about it. That's not the end. There's something else that we've got to live for. We're going to live beyond life beyond the grave. You understand that? And that's what this the resurrection is all about. It gives us hope concerning the resurrection. You take a loved one, a faithful Christian, and you go and you place them in the ground. That's not the last time you're going to see them. You know you're going to be able to see them again. Why? Because He's risen. 
Because Christ has arisen from the grave. Number three, and He demands our complete loyalty. In Romans 14, in verse number nine, nine, the Bible talks about how that because He died for us, that we ought to, uh, He has become uh, the Lord and Master of both the living and the dead. You understand that? That's, that's what that means. He demands our loyalty. Romans, he becomes uh, the Lord and Master of both the living and the dead. I want to I want to point out something to you in my conclusion. If Christ died, and He did, if Jesus verifies our justification and our hope in our resurrection is in His resurrection, then what does that mean to us, for us? That means that He demands that He become our Lord and our Master. Let me just preach to you just for a moment before we close. Brethren, I, I know it's easy to get dressed, come to church. But I, I have something here. And I thought it was a good illustration. This is a... I dropped it. This is an Easter egg. And my wife and I, we, we got together and we painted it and we colored it and then we wiped it off and done it again and... But anyway, you get the picture. It's a beautiful Easter egg. Oh, you know, this beautiful Easter egg, and it, it, it's, it's very decorative. But you know what about this egg? A lot of people are like this Easter egg. On the outside, they look very decorative and colorful. On the inside, hard boil. And you know that's the way a lot of people in the world are. They look good on the outside, but inwardly they're hard. They're callous. Don't be like an Easter egg. If you want to make Jesus Lord and Master, if you want to have loyalty to Him and He be your Lord and Master, it's not going to be just because you put on some dress clothes every now and then. It's going to be because you trust and you obey what God says to do to be saved. It's going to be because not only is the resurrection true, but in view of your own mortality, in view of your own resurrection one day, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming when all that are in the grave shall hear His voice and come forth. They that have done good in the resurrection of life, and they that have done good in the resurrection of damnation. Are you aware of the fact that one day you're going to stand before God Almighty in the judgment? And you're going to give an account. I'm glad. I'm glad this is not the end of us. I'm glad when we go to the cemetery and we put our loved one in the ground and they die in the Lord, I'm glad that we can say we'll see them again. I'm glad that we've got that hope, aren't you? But my friends, if you're like this egg and you're hard-boiled on the inside and you're calloused, and you're not going to listen and obey and trust God and do His will and become a child of God, you're going to have a different destiny. And that's the sad part. And the Lord said the majority of the people in the world would lose their soul. Why, Lord? Because they call me Lord, Lord, and they do not the things that I say. Luke 6.46 He is risen to become my Lord and to become my Master. What do I have to do for Him to become my Lord and my Master? Number one, I have to admit that I'm a sinner. I can't do it on my own. Fall short. I've got sin that separates me from God. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Therefore, I've got to get rid of sin. Only way I can get rid of sin is by the blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Colossians 1, verse 13 and 14, and uh, Romans chapter 1. He talks about how that it takes the blood to redeem us, to forgive us. How do you take the fact that Jesus shed His blood and you take my allegiance and you take my loyalty? How can you put those two? How do you make the connection there? When I believe Jesus, when I obey Him, trust Him, 
repent of my sins, when I confess that Jesus is Lord and Savior, and I'm baptized into Jesus Christ for the remission of my sins, I contact that blood, and the blood of Jesus has the power to eradicate, to get rid of that sin, and He gives me hope. Hope maybe for the very first time in my life that I can make Him Lord and Master, that I can live for the Lord, that I can serve Him, that I can trust Him, that I can know that whatever I go through in life, that Jesus is going to be there. All thanks be to God for the victory that we have in Jesus Christ, our Lord. In Romans 8, verse 37, all oh, thanks be to God that you are more than conquerors through Him, through Jesus Christ that guards us. Think about that for a moment. We're more than conquerors. Why? And how? Well, why? Because Jesus died for us and because He arose from the dead and because we committed our lives to Him. There are people in this assembly, large assembly today, if you were to die, you would die without hope. Think about your soul. Oh, friends, don't wait till it's too late. Someone just died this past week and they took six or eight of them to baptize them in a, in a sheet. Oh, I'm glad that she lived long enough to do that. I'm, I'm glad that someone has still got time and opportunity, but I'm here to tell you, friends, you don't know when you're going to die. I don't know when I'm going to die. And I don't want to waste another day living for the Lord. I want to serve Him every day of my life. He is risen. What do I have to do? I have to make Him Lord and Savior of my life. I have to obey the Gospel. Maybe today you're not a Christian. Would you walk down this aisle, take a seat on the front row, give your life and your heart to Jesus in obedience to the gospel? Would you repent? Would you say uh, that I want to change inwardly that will result in an outward change? Would I confess or would you confess this very day that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and would you be baptized to have your sins washed away? Don't argue about it. Just do what the Bible says. Friends, your salvation is predicated upon Jesus, not only His death and His burial, but His resurrection. If you've done that, and you've made Him Lord and Savior, and He's not the Lord of your life, why don't you come now? While together we stand as we sing together.